All right, welcome to the, I guess, annual by now advertising competition for Management 357. I am very pleased to see so many people dressed up. I don't recognize half the people in the audience, but, uh, but then again, you rarely see me wearing one of these either, so, so everything's fair. Once again, every year we seem to have better and better judges. The, the standard of our judging panel today, I think, is really as high as it's ever been. I want to welcome back the first two-timer judge, by that I mean it's the second time he's been the judge, sorry. <laughs> this is Jeff Goss. Jeff is the president and executive creative director at the Goss Agency here in Asheville. He has been involved in ads for St. Lucia, for Disney, for Austin Quality Foods. And Jeff is known for his love of the outdoors and especially fly fishing. In the middle here, we have a friend of mine, Luann Allgood. Luann is the executive and producer of Ooh La La. She has served as vice president of the, of the Florida chapter of the Association of Independent Commercial Producers. Luann has played bassoon with the Miami Symphony, and she's been featured on the NBC News with Brian Williams. It was a very interesting article. If you ever get the chance to go on, on the YouTube, you'll be able to see it. <laughs> and our third judge is Heather Haley. Heather has worked her way up to creative director at Foot Cold Belding in Chicago. She then switched to producing, where she became head of broadcast at Irwin Penland, where she worked with national accounts such as Verizon and Denny's. Heather is known for her artistic eye and has a passion for interior design. So, quick round of applause for the judges, please. Now, earlier in the semester, we had a draw for who was going first. And the running order will be Dana's team, followed by Kennedy's team, followed by Megan, followed by uh, Will, Tammy, and taking up the, the rear is Wes. OK, so could I call, please, on Dana's team to go first? Thank you. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dana. This is Jenny and Devin and Megan. And this is our advertisement that we did for the Presbyterian Heritage Center in Montreat. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. Now I'm going to pass it over to Devin to get us started with discussing our ad. So we drew the short straw, uh, or at least that's how we felt when we found out our client would be the Presbyterian Heritage Center in Montreat. It was decided in an epic rock, paper, scissors duel, and after Owen issued my defeat, I slumped back to my seat wondering how we got so unlucky. But as I reflected more about it, I realized that this is how it would be when I'm working in the industry. I don't get to choose my client, but I do get to choose how I advertise. This is how we approach this issue. And as we began to do our research on the Presbyterian Heritage Center, we realized that, in fact, we were handed a gift. In 1966, Dr. Martin Luther King visited the Presbyterian Heritage Center. This year marks the 50th anniversary since his historic visit. As soon as we realized this and spoke with our clients at the museum, we decided that we had a fundamental obligation to call to this truth in our advertisement. Walking through campus, tuning into the news, and scrolling through our social media news feeds, it seemed as though civil rights has seldom ever been as omnipresent as it has been in the last 18 months, from Ferguson to HB2. And we wanted to highlight that right here in West North Carolina, we have a little piece of that heritage. We were involved. He was there. And we want to encourage people to see what he saw. And now uh, Ginny's going to talk a little bit about our target market. So once we established the message that we wanted to portray in our ad, we needed to figure out who we wanted to target and how we were going to tailor our ad to our target market. So the first thing we thought about was the fact that the Heritage Center is located in the heart of Montreat College, which is a small private school near Black Mountain. Um, there's, not there's students all around, so we thought targeting students um, 
between the ages of 18 and 25 would really get students aware and um, participating in the events that the Heritage Center puts on. We also wanted to narrow our focus to local students, maybe students from the South, because as we know, the South historically has been a hub of controversy regarding civil rights issues and still is today. So once we established our target market, we needed to figure out how are we going to implement this um, demographic into our advertisement. I'm not sure if you were aware, but Devin and I were actually in the ad. Our group does rep represent the demographic that we were targeting, so we thought it would be appropriate for us to be in the ad representing the type of student that we would like to see visit the Heritage Center. Um, we appeared kind of casual and relaxed just to appeal to that, to that crowd. Um, a second way that we appeal to our target market is that we did not include any uh, page of copy at the end with any contact information, no phone, no phone numbers, no emails. And we did that on purpose because targeting young people, we, we have information all around us. We have access to the internet, to our phones, our computers. So with a 30 second ad, a couple seconds at the end is very valuable. And we did not, um, we did not think that we needed to provide that information when we're all very capable and eager to go out and find the information ourselves. So um, now Megan is going to talk a little bit about the symbolism that we put behind our ad. <clears throat> All advertising tells stories. Great advertising tells stories with meaning. This is what we aim to do when we decided to cover or have our ad focus on the civil rights movement. In the very beginning to appeal to our target market, you could see the two young students part of our target market uh, viewing the exhibit, the Martin Luther King Jr. exhibit at the Heritage Center. While they're viewing it, they're taken back in time to that historic moment when Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech. After that, it focuses back in on the images of Dr. King to bring the civil rights movement to the forefront of everyone's minds. Now, as you guys might have guessed, the Presbyterian Heritage Center is a religious museum. Um, but we figured a lot of our target market, maybe even a, a majority, is not incredibly religious. So we wanted everyone, we wanted to figure out how to make everyone feel welcome there. Devin opening the doors at the end with the light flooding through um, really is trying to give a, a feeling of openness and welcoming to the, the Heritage Center. So, in conclusion, when we were producing this ad, our group was faced with a dilemma. We had a small museum trying to draw attention to a big issue. And this is what we tried to call to in the messages in our ad. So how does this exhibit featuring the late Dr. King's visit possibly fit into the big issues faced by our country today? What I came up with was this. Awareness matters. Small things matter. And the way that we can convey these messages in our advertising matters. So here's my call to action to you all. Civil rights is a collective. It's a piece of our local history. And in order to see where we're going, we must see where we came from. So go see the exhibit. Listen to what he had to say and see what he saw at the President Harry Heritage Center in Montreat. And now, with all of that being said, keep that in mind, and we're going to go ahead and watch the ad one more time. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. All right, are there any questions from the judges? Well, I was just curious, was your attention that that would play on television? So that's a really good question. Um, and uh, our, our, when we originally were coming up with this ad, that was kind of a, a debate we were going back and forth, was um, is this something that um, is truly prepared for television, i.e. we're going to go through uh, everything and um, contact the estate um, to make sure we kind of, of Martin Luther King, to make sure we kind of crossed our T's and dotted our I's. Um, and in the end, what we decided for as a class was that we were really going to focus here um, on making advertising that we can all really feel proud of uh, an educational experience. And it but it was, it was intended to be a, a television ready ad. Yeah. Okay. If, 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 if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely.
Well, um, first of all, I love the um, like the over the shoulder opening. I think really kind of brings you in and makes me as a viewer feel like I'm there. Um, and also, I think the fact that Martin Luther King visited that you know he's such a big man and a, um, it, visiting this very small museum. I think that's a pretty extraordinary fact. I wish he went a little bit further in terms of giving us a hint about what he might have saw, or maybe did he ever return, or was there some, you know, just a little bit more information about the connection between him, him visiting and what his experience might have been there, Absolutely. so that I want to definitely visit it. Yeah. And, and the exhibit that, we, that they're looking at in that uh, tells more about what he did while he was there, mm -hmm. too, so. And our, our kind of original vision was to um, include all that, but with the kind of constrictions of, you know, doing something in 30 seconds, we wanted to really focus on, like, what she was talking about, the symbolism and some of the messages. So, um, yeah. Yeah, a couple of comments. I thought it was an interesting comment you made about the choice of client and going, like, <clears throat> at first it was a, you know, you may have gotten the short end of the stick. And over the years, I've been asked many times, you know, what's your favorite client and what do you like to work on most? And back before I worked on Disney, I used to say, wow, I think Disney would be a great client to work on. And what I realized that it's really not the product, but it's the client. The client, the personality that makes great advertising or not, that lets you do your best work. So that's the first point. I think this is a good feel-good spot that could go across many mediums might be good as a part of a series on other facts. Martin Luther King visited, XYZ visited, <clears throat> so-and-so happened here, XYZ happened here. But as far as a single message, it doesn't give me much or enough information about the center and what's distinctive and unique about it as far as my other options and where to go. And I thought that that might be a result of the approach you took, which was you focused on a message and then found a target audience, I heard you say. Yeah. yeah. We, we work just the opposite. <clears throat> we develop a creative brief with a key message identifying the target audience, and then we come up with the idea to fulfill that, to connect the two. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I, I guess our sort of methodology for that was um, the idea that Megan was talking about, about storytelling. Um, so when we kind of went in there and we found out about this exhibit, we really kind of got attached to the story. Um, and we really felt like this was a really good story for their, their brand to kind of expand who they were, their target market might have been, you know, which might have been somebody very different into someone um, like Jenny was talking about with sort of a younger audience. Um, and our process was definitely not linear. Um, we had, we pretty much started with a completely different ad. We cut parts out, put parts in. So it, I think it was more, we had this idea and maybe an idea of our target market and they both kind of evolved together, um, not necessarily a linear um, mm -hmm. process. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, it just brings me to one final point there. And you know, I think that that is, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, is a legend and has mm -hmm. a lot of broad appeal, but also it's, the name is used a lot, and he's in a lot of places, so it's, it doesn't create a lot of distinction for the center. That's, yeah. I, I, I think it was well done, well thought of, but at the end, I disagree with your decision about not having any contact information. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, if you all felt that, but that's like fundamental in our business. You need to reach out and see who to call, where to go, at least some, some sort of website or something. Mm -hmm. You can't count on people wanting to know more about it. You have to kind of put it in their face a little bit. Appealing to the target market that we were, like I don't, I don't know about any of our uh, classmates, but if I, if I see a website or something on an ad, I'm, I'm not gonna remember what it was. I'm just gonna Google what I remember the name was. And that's part of the reason we had the Presbyterian Heritage Center in Montreat as the last kind of thing on that white contrasting background to just really leave you with this is what it is, this is what we're talking about. Yeah, because as a business, it's more, you know, it's, um, less of something where contacts are gonna be driven into through the traditional media, like, you know, people aren't really gonna be calling or emailing them, that they're gonna be kind of seeking out that information. Like a museum, at least in my opinion, is a place where people are kind of going to seek out information. So I guess we were kind of 
continuing that. Um, trying to create some intrigue. Right, exactly. What, but I definitely hear what, what you're saying. They had questions like, how do I get there? Uh, uh, questions like, uh, what time? What are your hours of the museum so I can come and visit it if they don't go on? And you know, to me, I find that that is pretty standard in our business. I, yeah. I don't know if you two agree, <clears throat> but I would feel that way. Well, I think it has, it, you know, it is, but I, and it, where traditionally we, we have done that, but I thought it was interesting because you can get all that information when you immediately start to Google and it pops up Absolutely. and you find it and there's a phone number, directions, yep. website. Yep. So it could, I think, in that sense uh, be, you know, the, the possibility in the future for the what, way of things to come. Yeah. What do you so. think? I'm probably more concerned with the lack of information just about the museum in terms of a special, some feature about the museum that would draw me there. Yeah, yeah. In addition to the fact that Martin Luther King went there. Yeah, absolutely. And that's all really great feedback. And it was definitely things that we grappled with. Um, it was obviously something we thought about and, uh, you know, really played on that decision about whether we put in the contact information and, um, you know, how much information do we put in about the museum versus kind of how much do we really keep this core story. So, uh, and that's definitely feedback we got throughout, so. Well thought out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lucas, and this is Kennedy, Keenan, and Anna, and we did our ad on the Swannanoa Valley Museum. It's called the Swannanoa Valley because of um, the community itself. We are in the process of uh, finishing up this renovation. We're about $100,000 short. The major purpose of the Valley in the Alley project is to not only provide a fundraising event, but also to provide a wonderful exhibit. Purchased brick or granite will be laid to actually show the complete valley in the alley. So obviously our client for this project was the Swannanoa Valley Museum. Um, we worked closely with the museum's director, Ann Chesky Smith, and the head of construction, Bill Hanby, whose voice you overheard during the video. Um, the two women shown in the video were Libra Fairley and Suzanne Money. Uh, while the valley and the alley is still in the process of being designed and worked into their renovation, um, Libra and Suzanne somehow got their hands on an application, even though an application actually doesn't exist right now to buy a brick, which is why we chose them. Um, both of them have conquered the Swannanoa Valley Rim over the past couple of years, and Keenan will talk about that later. Uh, the museum is located in the middle of beautiful Swannanoa Valley in Black Mountain, North Carolina. The museum resides in the old Black Mountain Firehouse, built in 1921 and designed by Richard Sharp Smith, who at the time was also the supervising architect at the Biltmore Estate. The museum is home to photographs and artifacts, and artifacts relating to the settling of the valley as well as around Buncombe County. As the video stated, the museum is under a large large-scale renovation. I emphasize that completely. The entire inside of the museum was gutted in order to expose the natural brick in the interior of the building as well as the exterior. A second story with a staircase has been added. Two office spaces, a bathroom, and a break area for volunteer workers has also been installed. And a new steel support system has been put into place to keep the original architecture in ideal shape. The goal was to create a new and improved museum, an area for volunteers to call their own, and a newly bricked alleyway to serve as an additional outdoor exhibit. The renovation is due to be completed in July of this year. And to uh, kind of go on as what Anna said, this renovation was huge. Um, it started as a million dollar project and has now gone down to approximately $770,000 project. Um, and the reason is because they have had some issues with uh, fundraising the money, although fundraising has gone well for phase one. Um, and so as of right now, they're in phase two. So uh, when we created this, this ad, our primary goal for this ad was to kind of create some awareness, uh, create awareness around the community about the renovation, what's going on, and also to uh, promote the event Valley in the Alley. Uh, what Valley in the Alley is, is basically it's an alleyway right beside the museum. Uh, they want to create the Swannanoa Valley Rim in granite uh, bricks. And what you can do is you can buy a brick and engrave it with names of 
um, of your family or you know any loved one that might bring a memory to how it feels to live in Swannanoa. Uh, thank you. Uh, so basically, I'll turn it over to Keenan, who will talk about the target market. Um, so the target, our primary target market for this was the surrounding area of the community. As you heard Bill say in the beginning of the video, the Swannanoa Valley is a community. Um, and so actually Libba and um, the other woman kind of portray both sides of our target market. They live in the community. Um, and then our secondary target market would also be avid hikers who like to frequent the area and have conquered the Swannanoa Valley Rim like them. And so one thing that Bill had explained to me that uh, was very prominent and stuck with me was that um, in the community there were people who had literally ancestral roots to people who were the first white settlers in the area. And so those people would have a, in, uh, a familial connection to the Swannanoa Rim and would be the type of people who would buy a brick and put their, their name on it in the area where they lived. And so um, they were, they were the, area, the community was our primary target market because the, they live in the Swannanoa Valley area and they have seen all the beauty that it holds. And then to touch on the avid hikers part, Libba and uh, her partner, they conquered the rim in four years, um, but it normally takes one year. And so people like that are just people who will have, will develop a, a very deep connection with trails and they'll have favorite trails and everything where they have memories on certain parts. Uh, like Libba actually broke her wrist on one of the trails and that's not necessarily a, an event you want to commemorate in a brick. <laughs> but there are probably some happy events uh, in there as well where you can commemorate. Uh, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Kennedy who's going to talk about the aesthetic areas of the video. Hello, I'm Kennedy. Um, I deeply enjoy just creating um, and overseeing all the creative aspects of this video. Uh, what we really wanted to um, come to play was connecting the community, which is our target market, and appealing to them with showing the Swannanoa Valley, the beautiful scene in the beginning with the, um, the rim, um, the time lapse of the video, um, and then shifting into an outside view of the, it's the backside view of the museum under renovation. And, most likely people won't see that often, so we like to show that and um, a woman looking at it and it's under renovation and then from outside it shifts into inside scenes where it's shown the renovation inside, you see bricks, you see wood lying everywhere. Um, we really wanted to highlight the brick as well, so oftentimes there are overexposed shots in there, so people only see the brick and they're not wondering what's behind um, the windows and it's just overexposed, so it's completely white and all you see is the brick and it really emphasizes the brick and the renovation going on. Um, the logo was also placed in the bottom right hand corner for a specific reason. Most channels always have their logo there, so we wanted to keep the logo down in the, in the bottom right to kind of dragged, attract the, visual, the, the viewer's eyes because usually you subconsciously look to the bottom right and say, what channel am I on? So, the Swannanoa Valley Museum logo kind of um, sticks out right there. And the font right next to it is uh, the same kind of serif font that the logo has. So keeping that theme congruent um, provides like a brand um, cohesiveness. Um, and I believe that is it. Now that you have heard all of us talk about the backbone of the ad, please enjoy the second viewing. It's called the Swannanoa Valley because of um, the community itself. We are in the process of uh, finishing up this renovation. We're about $100,000 short. The major purpose of the Valley in the Alley project is to not only provide a fundraising event, but also to provide a wonderful exhibit. Purchased brick or granite will be laid to actually show the complete valley in the alley. All right, after seeing the uh, ad a second time, we'll open the floor for questions. I have a question about the objective. Is the objective to, is a fundraiser, uh, you know, to, uh, or is it to drive visitation eventually once the museum is 
complete. Well, we kind of ran into that same issue um, as well until late later into the weeks. Uh, we thought originally that the idea was supposed to be that we were going to basically promote the valley in the alley, have people see this ad and want to buy a brick and uh, look for look for information. Well, as of right now, they're they're still in renovation. This is the the final phase of their renovation. So basically what they're doing is they're getting all the information together. They just want to promote um, what this is and, and uh, where they can find some more information. Uh, they, they really didn't, they did not speci specify, 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 sorry, <laughs> specify. They didn't specify that um, they wanted a commercial where we were basically asking for money. It's just here, this is an event that we're about to, to hold. Uh, we'd like for you guys to find information. Yeah, and the reason I ask the question is because it's just like in branding, to get people to buy a product, putting the logo on the TV spot or wearing it on a sleeve, it's not gonna get people. A lot of clients make my logo bigger. One of my instructors used to have a T-shirt that said, make the idea bigger and the logo smaller. And because for the same reason, people aren't going to invest or be interested in buying a brick until they understand what is this museum about? What's it going to do for me? How's it going to make me feel? And I think you rattled off a lot of facts that are going to be happening in the museum or artifacts that are very interesting when put all together, which could create a brand and destination for the museum. And it seems that, that the message got drifted over here toward fundraising and a lot about the project and what they're going to do versus what is this place going to be. And uh, a lot of times clients will lead you astray in that way. It's uh, you know, getting them back on point to what is the key message and going to be most motivating. But I thought it was very you know, nicely put together and a good message. That's why I asked the question, would be a good fundraising spot if that was the clear objective. But I think that could only come after you've established an interest in the brand. And that's what we were trying to do, is we were essentially trying to create awareness of what Swananoa Valley is, a brief description of, or shots of the rim hikes. Um, and people drive by it, so they may not know it's being renovated because it looks beautiful on the outside. But on the inside, it's gutted. So we wanted to really um, get in there and show them what's going on and showing the backside of the um, of the building, but also raising awareness, saying, hey, if you want to come to the valley in the alley, this is when the renovation will be done, and you can be able to see the new renovation and all the work that we've done. But we, yeah, I understand that um, highlighting kind of what this renovation is bringing would be a good factor, too. And Jeff, building a little bit on, on your comment, um, I also felt like it was missing a little bit of that information, but even if, you mentioned the target was the, the local people, so even if they knew what was in the museum and, and what it was about, I still felt like there was a little bit of emotional connection missing in the in your spot. Like I didn't, assuming I, I knew about the museum, I still didn't feel like I was emotionally driven to step in there and either visit or give money for it. I, I thought your mm -hmm. opening was really terrific. I was like, oh, I want to know more, because I thought it was really good. But then when you started focusing on those bricks, that close-up of the bricks, I was like, it didn't do anything for me. Mm -hmm. And I felt from the rest of the commercial on, it's like, where's the hook? I needed a hook. I needed a reason to stay with you. And I was with you in that opening shot. I thought that was great. It's like, I want to go to that museum. And, and just one final thought, too. I, that, that makes me think also of, you know, as far as the key message goes, um, and that hitting that emotion, digging into the history and finding the story of the people live, you know, moving here and the survival, <laughs> and just focusing 30, yeah. 26 seconds on telling their story, and then say, see it, feel it at the Swannanoa Museum. And then that, you know, is, is really why you want to go there. And it's, uh, you know, the more dramatic and compelling that story, and then you'd have the hook. Because um, you mentioned some of the familial history um, that's in that area, that if, if some of that was featured, you know, a story from, from that was featured, then that would 
maybe make people say, yeah, I'm a part of that. That's part of my heritage as somebody that lives here. Or I want to know more about it or something, but the focus on the construction of it and going up the stairs and the bricks didn't give me enough reason to, to really just buy into the whole thing. But good job. There's a good message in the fundraising, and you know, if, if you were established in the brand and understanding already, if you were already there, I think there's a mm -hmm. good, yeah. This was actually um, our third ad. So <laughs> our first ad was more, um, it was showing the two women, and they were talking about all their hilarious experiences and laughing. And then um, we decided that it had nothing to do talking about Valley in the Alley. and. Um, that was kind of our goal to talk about it. So, and being um, impossible to replicate and duplicate and all that stuff with uh, video editing and sound effects and talking, it was impossible. So we had to reshoot again and when, then we created a second ad and it was entirely on the renovation and it was a failure. And so we created this third ad and kind of incorporated the women um, as well. But. Um, a story of a background of them would have been good for an emotional feel if it's to the community. Just to let you know, I know agencies that have presented a hundred concepts to clients and they didn't buy one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So or editors who edit like ten versions and yeah. not, somebody says it, none of them. It's a, it, yeah. You know, there's it's just like molding clay and you just yeah. got to play with it and uh, you, you know so. Well, one other thing that might be helpful too on the target audience, you mentioned the local community, which I think is valid, especially they would have a vested interest. And then you mentioned hikers. We do a lot of travel and tourism marketing, and that's what we call affinity targets. They have an affinity toward a specific activity. And if it's like a lot of the affinity, and we've targeted hikers before, when they're on that trail, there's very little that's going to pull them into and off that trail like a lot of the other affinity targets. So what would be a better target, in addition to the local community, would be cultural travelers who are traveling to the area to see other, the Biltmore travelers. So targeting them through geo-targeting and mobile marketing, mm. who would come into the area to, mm -hmm. to visit the Biltmore estate, get them over here to see your museum, would be a much better and more realistic target. And even locally, I mean, I live here locally, I want a reason to go there. Yeah. They didn't give me enough reason to, to get in my car and drive to Black Mountain to see it. Because the name's cool. You'd want to see it. Yeah. Well, it is a kind of, I mean, it's kind of a funny name. And I love the idea yeah. of focusing on the, like, like two women that have that special experience between them in this area. I mean, I kind of love the idea of focusing on that because a lot of the places that I personally love to travel to, being a cultural traveler, are because they're little funky towns with funky yeah. people and, yeah. and yeah. strange yeah. stories. Yeah. And, yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. We want to thank you for coming and taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. I'm Elizabeth, and these are my colleagues, Megan, Maddie, and Marissa. And we will be showing you our commercial for the Thomas Wolfe Memorial. Discover history at the Thomas Wolfe Memorial. So we had a wonderful initial meeting with our client, it was Thomas Muir, and in our meeting with him, he expressed a desire to really invigorate interest in historic sites in our local community amongst younger generations. Based on that, we hoped to have our target market be families that have young children. Our hope is that these children will come build lasting memories at locations such as the Thomas Wolfe Memorial and hopefully bring their children in future generations to keep these sites alive throughout history. And now, oh, and now Megan is going to tell you about our storyline. 
Hi, I'm Megan. Um, so the star of our commercial was Trip. Trip is four years old, um, and we thought that was just the right age to get to these families who were our target market um, and tell the story that we needed to tell. You might have noticed there was no adult. We did not let him run around the house like crazy. Um, we just thought it was less confusing for the audience to only follow one character. Um, and also, it gives the camera the chance to act as the adult following him around the house. As far as our story, we didn't just want an infomercial. We wanted it to be informational, but also tell a story, which was why we didn't tell you it was for the Thomas Wolf Memorial until the end of the commercial. We wanted to intrigue the viewer and also make you want to follow this little boy around the house to find out where he was. And now Maddie will tell you about the visual components of the commercial. All right, so this is like my little baby. I'm a mass comm major, so this is perfect for me. Um, so the next step was filming and editing. We chose to focus on just the house instead of the house and the visitor center um, because there was a lot more visual interest inside the house itself. Um, and it allowed us to be more clear in the story. We didn't want to switch between two different locations that are very different in style. Um, we filmed closer shots to focus on the details in the house because it is such an amazing house. It was built in uh, the 1800s, so there's a ton of history there. Um, and we also wanted people to wonder what he was looking at and we'd be like, okay, what are those books about? What is that? You know, what music is he listening to? What was the thing that he was playing with? Um, the other added benefit is that you do feel like you're the adult with him. You're traveling with him. You're going with him to these, these places. Um, during editing, we actually slowed down the shots a lot. Um, Trip is a very fast mover as a four-year-old, so we had to adjust for that. But then it also gave the commercial more relaxed feeling. Um, we ended our story with Trip on the front porch to reflect our client's hopes for the museum to be part of the community. Um, the front porch and rocking chairs are southern symbols of lazy afternoons and good times with friends and family, just the type of emotions that we wanted to resonate with our target market. Um, and it also places the Thomas Wolfe Memorial as part of your neighborhood, part of uh, your backyard, I guess you could say. And now uh, Marissa will talk about the auditory components. Okay, so for the auditory component of our ad, we chose to include an instrumental royalty-free song called Porch Swing Days. Consisting of acoustic guitars and a light chorus, the song has an upbeat yet soft melody that aligns with the mood we wanted to convey in our ad. It evokes a carefree attitude and matches the tempo of the film while following the rhythm of Tripp's movements as he explores the house. The name of the song itself, Porch Swing Days, is relevant to our ad since the restored wraparound porch is a symbolic attribute of the Thomas Wolfe Memorial. The last element of our ad is a voiceover rediscover history at the Thomas Wolfe Memorial. We wanted to limit dialogue to a short and straightforward tagline to close the ad with a strong message for the audience to consider. Because we are marketing to families, we hope to draw them to the Thomas Wolfe Memorial so that parents can discover history through the experiences of their children. With the portrayal of Tripp exploring the historical features of the house, we hope that parents will want to share this experience with their children in rediscovering history. And with that, we will show the commercial one more time. Rediscover History at the Thomas Wolfe Memorial. We hope that you've enjoyed our ad, and we would invite any questions from the judges. Well, Trip is an angel, just so you know, for a four-year-old, <laughs> and for a four-year-old to get through that house and not, not wreck anything. He's amazing. <laughs> so, so is the is the museum um, interactive like that? Like, could a four-year-old go in and touch those items? All of the stuff that Trip interacted with were things that were okay for anyone to interact with. So, yeah. I mean, that's an unusual feature, mm -hmm. I think. I mean, I, I like the idea of seeing a, a child discover mm -hmm. those things. And it's interesting because your, your um, tagline, your rediscover history, I, I mm -hmm. kept thinking he's really discovering history for the first time, the little boy is. But I like the mm -hmm. idea of him wandering around the house and discovering those things and being able to be interactive. To me, as a parent, that's a draw to that museum. I think your concept was really solid, and I love the little shot when he's going like through the kitchen. Mm -hmm. He's got that crazy little look on his eyes. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's just like that little devilish but excited look, and I thought you captured that so nicely. Um, you know, the story flows. I, I, I could be a little picky on some of the production shots and stuff, but we're not, we don't need to really go there because I think you told the story and I think you told it, told it well. I go back to the target audience again on this one, I'm very similar to the Swannanoa Museum. That uh, with target, I think that's a nice objective to get families, local families, in or visiting families. Um, I'm not sure that, and I, I think it was well done with, with the kid trip, but as a parent and having raised children, I, 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 this is not the age I would take my children to the museum. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I don't Point. think they would get a, the experience out of it that would be rewarding and meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I'd rather take them to J Jamboree or to the river, you know, something. That's but um, I, I think that goes back to the target audience of targeting again the cultural traveler to Asheville. He's already here for other visits and really getting them over to the museum. And, and also again, I think it's the compelling story of Thomas Wolfe that would get him there. It's, it's the, a literary giant who wrote all these amazing stories that are nationally known Nobel Peace winner and getting, I think that's the biggest opportunity. So a good message and a good spot flows well. Mm -hmm. It's engaging, it's cute, um, but I think it misses the mark of the target audience and the real opportunity in really telling the story of the Thomas Wolfe house. I, I kind of agree with you. I have to think about that. And it's true, most uh, older people read books, but I still like the story and how it was told. But you know, that little guy's not going to be reading Thomas Wolfe. But was right. <clears throat> yeah. Good point. So I think that to to that's a wonderful point, and to address it, um, Tom, the lovely gentleman that we got to meet, he really wanted to introduce Thomas Wolfe to younger and younger generations, and to reinvigorate younger people to want to learn more and see more. Maybe a four-year-old is not the person to go to necessary, you know, experience. Thomas Wolfe, but maybe to take a step back in time to see how people lived a hundred years ago. Um, and we want to catch those children at a younger age, get them interested in something other than Jimbury or Chuck E. Cheese, you know, maybe go to a museum, enjoy these interactive things that don't necessarily involve um, a ball pit. <laughs> and I think well, I agree that they missed the, perhaps the age in terms of casting the child. I do remember, like as a, a kid myself, like having like Pioneer Day at school that was maybe fourth or fifth grade or something where we all dressed up like pioneers and carded wool and did the, you know, spinning mm -hmm. wheel and stuff like that. So I, I think that, you know, that age, that eight to. <laughs> 12 mm -hmm. might be a better yeah. better age for some of those. But I still think right. the interactivity in a museum that has some real historical content is still pretty unique. Because okay. usually the interactive museums are, are everything's new. You know, there's nothing that's real historical and interactive. I mean, like Fernbank is a good example in Atlanta. You know, it's a, it's a very child-friendly museum, a lot of interactive exhibits. And um, it's a place you would take children that age. I just think there's a bigger target audience and um, for people who would appreciate Thomas Wolfe and, and some of that is family, but I think it's a little, that's a little young, I can see a little older to that point, mm -hmm. you know, eight to 12. We took our kids to Williamsburg and Yorktown and those kind of things. But um, it gets back to it really in the very beginning, ascertain where's the lowest hanging fruit? Where's the, mm -hmm. where are you gonna get the most bang for your buck and doing the spot target audience wise. So uh, in Jimbery, uh, I, I, I agree, I don't think that's a great place. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, well, good. Yeah. Thank you. I, I enjoyed it though. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie Degnan. This is Will Floor and Owen Ryan and we had the Smith McDowell House.
Did you end up making it to that party last night? My parents would not let me get out. Hmm. What is this? In this fast-paced world, disconnect with technology and reconnect with the rich history of Asheville. Explore the oldest surviving house in Western North Carolina that was once home to some of Asheville's most influential citizens. The Smith McDowell House will open a window to a new part of Asheville that you have never seen before. So uh, to start off this advertisement, we showed um, two teenage to college age students or uh, people walking up to a house. Um, we don't show exactly what the house is right off the bat. Um, but we see that they have headphones in and we convey the message of one of them being on the phone. The reason for doing this is to target um, our target audience of parents. Now, our reason for showing this technology was to show that transition of them having the technology, being on the phone, talking about parties. When they get into the Smith McDowell house, it shows them disconnecting from technology. Now the reason for doing this was to show parents reconnecting with their children and that the Smith McDowell house could provide this. Um, so yeah, so that was our thought process and um, the beginning of this and um, trying to connect with our target market. And Owen's gonna talk more about um, the creative process. Cool. So we first met with uh, a lady named Lisa who's the museum curator. And at first she was a little standoffish. She didn't know um, like what kind of ad we were gonna do or if we were really passionate about it. Um, but we were talking to her and she had uh, helped us come up with the idea of getting parents involved because tickets to the place are $9 and we thought that students, it may be hard to convince like a group of students to come spend $9 each to get in there. We think that parents that are visiting their uh, kids in college may uh, have a better time paying for that. Um, so Lisa, she was super helpful. She knew everything about the early 19th century, and she was really involved in keeping our ad as accurate as possible. And in one way it was very accurate, as you saw, um, they let us get into their costume room and use clothes that were um, actually worn in the 1900s. And so you saw our female actress, she had a hoop skirt on, and I had a jacket that was actually like worn back in the early 19th century. So. She was really excited about that, and we were too, to keep the accuracy there. Um, another creative choice we had was we used multiple shots for each, um, for each scene. So when, when we were walking up on the phone, we had it from the, from the front, we had it from the balcony, and then from the side. And in a 30-second spot, we feel like a lot of different um, scene changes makes it feel longer. So although it was only four seconds walking up to the door in the actual 30-second spot, it felt a little bit longer, and the conversation felt longer. And then also, so originally we just had the visuals and we didn't have any narration because we thought that the story told itself. But as we were watching it over and over and showing it to people that didn't have the idea with us, they didn't really know what the, the phone was because it's kind of small and then um, they weren't really sure um, about like the idea of why we want them to come to Smith McDowell House. So when we added the narration, we think it uh, helped really convey it a lot better. And here's Will, he's gonna talk about the music. Okay, so I actually made the music for our ad uh, myself, and uh, I wanted to make it like a very specific objective for our group to like try to customize music to our ad. So I waited uh, until we were done uh, editing the whole ad, and we'd been to the house a couple times, and I uh, made the music myself. Uh, I was lucky my uh, two roommates are the studio managers here at the music tech department at UNCA, so I got to cut the line and have the studio to myself for a day, knock it out. Um, originally, like Owen said, we just had the visuals and I created like a very uh, disorienting um, kind of like, there's like a lot of uh, crowds being sampled and there's like random like different beats playing, trying to like subliminally uh, get across the message that things are very distracted these days for children. But then uh, we decided to take that out to like create more of a character with Owen talking on his phone. Uh, so I just threw in like a, a very monotonous like looped drum beat in the background that might be coming through her headphones. It was just boring and like obviously less interesting than this museum. So with that, we're gonna play it one more time. Did you end up making it to that party last night? My parents would not let me get out. Hmm, what is this? In this fast paced world, disconnect with technology and reconnect with the rich history of Asheville. Explore the oldest surviving house in Western North Carolina that was once home to some of Asheville's most influential citizens. The Smith McDowell House will open a window 
to a new part of Asheville that you have never seen before. And do you guys have any questions? I'm sure you do, and comments. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I really thought it was really well done, so congratulations. I think your track was really good. I like the little sound effects in there with the chimes and the little special effects that you did. That was really nice. Um, the, the part of the concept that didn't work for me is when you're walking up knowing where you're going, opening the door, and then you go, what is this? <laughs> I mean, if you're opening the door, you kind of know you're there. That, that's the part that just didn't quite fit for me. Um, so other than that, I thought it was, uh, you know, nicely done. Other comments? And, yeah, I'm going to start with the, the positives. I really love the message, dis disconnect. I think that's very appealing. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of gravitation toward that. In fact, a lot of blogging is going on about that right now you know, on LinkedIn. and. It's just a very popular subject of just unplug and leave your phone mm -hmm. alone and uh, live life, you know, mm -hmm. be in the moment. So that's that's very appealing. I was confused by the 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 message target audience again. You said family, and yet it's to what look like college students, but they're being portrayed as what a teen dating. Or I I was confused by the target audience profile. Mm -hmm. And, and also the coming up to the door, what is this, that threw me. But once that door opened, mm -hmm. I love the fact that you, you put me in the moment. Mm -hmm. It did what we were talking about earlier. It gives me a reason for going there. I can feel and experience the time of the past and what McDowell House has that, that puts me in that moment of another place, another time. So that, I thought that was very appealing. And um, the... Um, there's a hokey, unrealistic, yeah, that opening, that was uh, the scene changes. And the interactive, uh, that, that's, that's, that's a plus, you know, the interaction and with the exhibit. So I, I got a good feeling about the place, it just needs to be cleaned up with the opening. Um, yeah, and for the target audience, um, we just used the two students because we wanted to portray it as if you were a parent watching that and being like, okay, there goes uh, you know, a child, or not a child, but like a student going in, oh, they're disconnecting from their phone, mine could do the same thing. Yeah, look, mm -hmm. uh, parents looking for a place to get their kids off of their phone yeah. and to look at something else was mm -hmm. the idea. Also, walking into the door was definitely goofy. The idea was that he's so lost in his conversation and he was just on a walk that he ran into a actual house. Yeah, that struck me. I mean, the, the him saying that and then <laughs> the quick cut to the, the, the bing, to them in the outfits yeah. to me struck me as a little comedic which I mean just which to me makes it makes it fun I share your confusion about the target market though because I, I can I find it very hard to believe that two kids that age would disconnect from their phones without like me as a, a parent taking them out of the hand and go, you know so to me it would be more believable if you portrayed a family rather than the two kids together, which I think the last thing they would do is give up those phones voluntarily, you know. But I did like, I mean, I thought the, um, I mean, I wouldn't call it comedy, but having a little, a little bit of a comedic mm -hmm. lean to it, like with coming in and all of a sudden a family being in, in those costumes, is kind of a fun way to yeah, show the... So too, it's just, I was confused by the target audience. Yeah. And the fact you're targeting families, mm -hmm. it's two college kids, and, you know, I don't think of that as, you know, the family, but I don't think it's unrealistic that kids, uh, not kids, that, you know, individuals your age would go to a museum and, mm -hmm. you know, disconnect. I think that you could hit them without a message uh, and that would work. Yeah. It, it, you know, except for the opening where I think once you got into the place, it's like the rest of it made me want to go there. So yeah. good yeah. job. And were those, <laughs> was that, um, was the target, as you showed, it supposed to be college age or high school age? Um, or? Yeah, so like someone, like an adult, visiting their kid in college and looking for an activity to do in Asheville. Yeah. Or, but also Nina, um, the lady we met, she talked about how they also want to get the local local audience. So, like maybe a local high school parent would want to see their kid do that too. Yeah. And also with the comedy part, is like we didn't necessarily mean it to be funny 
while we were shooting it, but like once we got in all these like old time outfits and like Lisa, uh, Nina who was working there was like kind of laughing at us and thought it was funny that like these random college kids came and like put on all their clothes. We saw the comedy in that and so the that kind of weird transition that we did that was pretty funny, I thought kind of matched the attitude that she had with college students coming into the museums. Well, I love the transition from the outside to the oh, inside. Oh, I did too. I it was and even though good. he seems lost, like I get it once you pop yeah, in there. Absolutely. I kind of get it. Great. And I'm glad to know that, like, but if they're college age, I'm glad to know that you give up your friends voluntarily. Yes. But <laughs> high school, no way. <laughs> so. yeah, I just can't see parents directing kids that age to do Anything. I mean, what y'all? <laughs> but, so, yeah, so I mean, but how about like a? I mean, a family that has a high schooler and a middle schooler or so something. Family, and it works without your explanation. Of we're targeting families. Mm. You just threw that out, and you have two college kids walking up doing that transition. That's believable to me. That you would decide to go on a date on the weekend to the museum and check it out um, and step back in time. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Um, my name is Gallo, this is Tammy, this is David, and this is Alex. And actually ours was not a museum, it's the Western Regional Archives, which is a collection of documents, photos, and, and history. And history. <laughs> The Western Regional Archives are your resource to investigate history by going to the original records and uncovering the past through photographs, documents, ledgers, and legends. We encourage everyone to come, young, old, students, professors, you can always discover and learn something new, so come to the Western Regional Archives and discover what you can find. So the Western Regional Archives is full of history and information and many different and iconic collections. We could have very easily focused on just one collection, but the archives isn't just one collection. It's about making connections between the collections. It's more than the sum of its parts. The the, but so we tried to use several of them. The ones we ended up using were the Black Mountain College, which is its most popular collection, the Slagle Wycliffe Collection, the Carson Family Papers, Folk Moat USA International Folk Festival Collection, the UNC Film Collection, and the Alexander Family. With these collections, we had lots of material to work with, but the actual archives themselves, they're all neatly put on shelves in files and in folders. And so visually, that was not what the archives is about. It's about digging into it and discovering all the images and the stories of individuals and actual people. And so the way we decided to combine all those things into one uh, commercial was a moving collage. Uh, this was to create a sense of time and movement, uh, to bring the images to life, to give you a sense that you were moving from the past to the present. We wanted this to uh, be visually appealing f for uh, older and younger people. Because, you know, as an archives, their target audience are people who are already interested in history and want more than what they can find in the museum. They want depth, they want research, they want information. And so, with that, I'll hand it off to Alex. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alex. And in order to create a truly effective commercial, we had to find out what the target market would, of that commercial would be. We talked with the lead archivist at the Western Regional Archives, Heather, about what her current form of people arriving at the museum and the, yeah, the market of uh, the archives, thank you, of mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the archives, and the market that she wanted us to capture with this commercial. We found out that currently uh, you would have college students and researchers and older uh, more adult researchers coming to the archives for the chance and opportunity to see the first-hand experiences and all of the different first-hand <sighs> collections and compositions. 
what we were trying to capture was high school age students and any other people in the Solananoa Asheville area who had an interest in history, however, were unaware of the power and the scope of the archives and what it could do for their research possibilities. And to talk more about is Robert. the visuals. So I'm David, and uh, a major theme in our commercial was the passage of time. And uh, we represented this in two different ways, which were uh, bringing the progression from the black and white photos to sepia to full color. And then the second was the moving collage, as Gallup said. And um, the collage was meant to bring the viewer kind of through time as the photos go through time, um, kind of just through the airs. Um, the oldest images date back to the 1700s and come from the Carson family collection, while the most recent are from the UNC Film Commission and feature uh, behind the scenes shots from the, uh, the movie The Last of the Mohicans. And to finish off, is the okay. Um, so one of the things that the Western Regional Archives does is it tells individual stories through their collection. So the number one collection, as Gala said, was the Black Mountain College collection. This is a collection of photographs, school records, letter, love letters. Um, it tells the story of a, of a World War II spy who came here as a professor. Um, it talks about um, inappropriate professors. Um, pinching behinds of students. Um, there's a lot of different stories that came out of just that one collection. So it was just incredibly hard to show the diversity of what Black Mountain College was. Black Mountain College was um, a avant-garde liberal arts school here in the 30s through the 1950s. Um, and during that short tenure, it attracted a lot of talented people to art, architecture, history, literature, and a lot of the modern dance movement, a lot of the avant-garde art movement came out of Black Mountain College. The archivist refers to Black Mountain College as the little college that could. And from Jewish refugee faculty members being bringing form and color to the art forms of modern art and painting and weaving to the modern dancers of that time period. All of this was brought to rural Western North Carolina. Now, one of the things that our client stated was that she could see using our commercial in so many different ways. Um, through social media outlets, using it as presentations to explain who and what they are to the community and how they can give folks an overview of the, what the Western Regional Archives does. So we're gonna invite you all to come discover your own stories at the Western Regional Archives. Come out, pick a topic, get to know Heather and Sarah and discover your own, your own story or your own collection as you research through the Western Regional Archives. And now we'll play our commercial again. The Western Regional Archives are your resource to investigate history by going to the original records and uncovering the past through photographs, documents, ledgers, and legends. We encourage everyone to come, young, old, students, professors, you can always discover and learn something new. So come to the Western Regional Archives and discover what you can find. I hope you enjoyed the commercial and we would like to invite in questions. I really loved, I love that you used the moving collage. I think that was a, a really interesting way to show all those stories. And I think something that's really important that you guys hit on was that really your, um, the product isn't really the paper and photographs and stuff, but the stories that they tell upon you interacting with those items. So I think that's a, is a good insight and I appreciate that moving collage. I think that's a great way to show that there's a lot of different stories and a lot to discover there. It, it was definitely information overload. Mm -hmm. And so while we wanted the, the images to tell a story, we wanted what Heather said to be very concise mm -hmm. so that you would get the invitation and that it is a resource and a service. Any other? Um, I thought visually it was very strong, so tell us how you did the collage. Um, it's actually, uh, we took a series of photos, we scanned them in, and then 
I actually taught my team members how to composite them in Photoshop. And it's actually one huge Photoshop file that is 270 inches long. Um, I dropped a drop shadow onto it to create a more sense of depth. And then in After Effects, we used the camera to create a parallax so that they really, like, you could tell that it was visually interesting, but you didn't know what it was. Very nice aesthetics. I thought it told the story. I thought aesthetically it was very strong. It made me want to go there. I want to know about Jasper Johns and John Cage and Joseph Albers and more of, you know, <laughs> what that has to offer. Now I know I can go and find it there. And that's where it's located. Well, Heather also wrote a book on that, and she's traveled all over the world um, kind of pitching that collection. She recently got back from Germany. She's been to um, Boston. So that collection has taken her literally all over the world, that one collection cool. in the archive. Yeah, nicely done, guys. Really nice. Yeah, I like the collage effect as well. I think it, it tells the story nicely that you have a lot of rich archives and memorabilia and information, records, photographs here. And uh, if I'm interested in that, if I have a particular subject in mind and from this area, I'm likely to find mm -hmm. some good information there. Yeah, it, it was, we thought it was the general populace at first. That was the target audience, you know, just people in Western North Carolina. But then the big thing was realizing these people already know about history, but they want more. And that's what really helped us make a commercial for that target audience. Yeah, they wanted to drill down, and all the artists that you were just speaking about, each of those has their own separate category within the Black Mountain College collection. So there are people that come just to research one of their descendants. And one of the neat things about the Black Mountain College collection is um, they had one of um, the people that was in uh, Scarface, Richard De Robert De Niro, his father went to Black Mountain College. Yeah, so, you know, it even has, you know, like the whole six degrees of separation thing. I think that's a really smart realization you made with the target market because you're right, somebody that's not um, a history buff or isn't willing to go there and make some effort to discover isn't going to get as much out of it as somebody who goes there and is actively engaged. Well, one of the cool things about the collection was that there is such an avant-garde piece. It was one of Dave's favorites. They had cigarette papers that they had printed the entire like play, the schedule for the play on, and it was meant to be smoked afterwards. So it, it, these are the only two that are known in existence in the entire world from the Black Mountain College collection. So it, it was just really an unusual you know, piece of history to find you know, in the archives. Well, I would b really be interested in going there now to research like Joseph Albers because I've always been interested in what he brought to Black Mountain College and how he, he attracted such talented, uh, some of the foremost artists in the United States. That tells me it's a research center to go to. And when the school ended, it created all these little pockets of, um, you know, like a poetry pocket out west and, mm -hmm. and uh, art and a modern history and dance. All of those can trace their lineage right back to Black Mountain College Museum between the 30s and the 50s. So visually terrific. I thought that was really well done, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I think so. Um, yeah, really, and you know, it's low budget, you can tell, but still, I think it's a very well executed mm -hmm. concept, and it hits a target audience of someone mm -hmm. who wants to know about history, mm -hmm. yep. and it compels me to go. And there's a tagline in there, too, that in your narration, if you read it again, the one that documents records, archives, and legends, you know, mm -hmm. with the right voiceover. Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah, nice. Yeah, very good. yeah that's, that was good. <laughs> yeah. It's very good. I, we actually, um, among all the things, uh, the voiceover was the thing that we redid several times because at first we just let Heather run with it and it was very abstract. It was very, you know, touchy feely, flowery, but it didn't actually tell you what the archives were. So then it was like, we have to narrow this down and concise it into an actual message. So I think it was good and clear and yeah, so that was a second that was a second take because the first take the we listened to it and we're just like, well, we don't really know what the archives do from listening to that. They're neat stories, but it really didn't give the nitty gritty or the bread and butter for what she's known for. 
So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey everybody, um, my name is Casey Blackwood. This is Angel Fong, Wesley Allen, and Thomas Vance. And for our client, we had Zebulon, Ban or Zebulon B. Vance Birthplace State Historic Site. And this is our commercial. Nestled in Weaverville's beautiful Reams Creek Valley, the Zebulon B. Vance Birthplace State Historic Site is a place where you can get your hands on history. Come explore the boyhood home and fascinating career of North Carolina's Civil War governor. See what life was really like in the early 19th century of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And in May 2016, we invite you to experience all new exhibits in the Visitor Center Museum. And now, uh, Angel will tell you more about the target market for our ad. Good afternoon. Our target market for this commercial is the middle age bracket, ages 50 and older. We, we marketed our ad to this demographic due to the 2010 Rich Advisory study with 40,000 respondents, which showed that history, uh, historic sites have generally older visitor bases, with 65% of respondents being over the age of 50. We also had to keep in mind that a quarter of respondents to this study well, we're parents of children of many ages. Over half are in middle school and the other are in high school. Next, I would like to introduce Wesley, who will go over the structure. So for the actual filming aspect of the project, we had to minimize um, the inclusion of a lot of unwanted background, um, basically objects and scenery. The Vance Birthplace is undergoing a, uh, a new exhibit construction. So there's a lot of different um, forms of equipment and vehicles on the property that we didn't want to get in the landscape shots. Um, there's also some modern houses um, very close to it and some roadways that we had to avoid um, to make it more visually appealing. Um, so with this in mind, we began the commercial with a shot um, of the highway sign to provide a clear introduction of who our client was. Um, what follows from there are several panning shots of the landscape um, which showcase all the important buildings um, that are part of this beautiful early 1800s um, homestead. And then we decided to end with a view of the sign at the main entrance in order to highlight um, the hours of operation of the site. We also decided to insert additional contact information at the end. Um, it was very important for us to slow down this particular section um, so that we would give the viewer enough time to absorb the material and the text. Um, the script for the voiceover was very well written by our site contact, Michael Moore, um, and he's the current manager of the Vance Birthplace. But luckily for our, our team, that script worked out very nicely. The voiceover wound up being 26 seconds long, which gave us enough time to basically um, start it a few seconds in to allow the music to kind of build. Didn't hear it at the first go around because of the volume, but we'll fix that on the second one. Um, but the music basically, um, it was a, a bluegrass style music, and that was something that he had mentioned that he might want to see in there because um, that genre um, basically resonated well with their target market. Um, and he knew that that was something that would fit nicely with the theme of like the older mountain style, um, or the old mountain lifestyle. And from now, I'd like to go ahead and reintroduce Thomas. Um, he's going to elaborate on the symbolism and purpose of the techniques that we used in our editing and filming. Hello, all. Um, so our main goal for this ad was to invoke as much curiosity from the viewer as possible with uh, our statements from the voiceover and our camera shots. Um, for the voiceover in particular, we really want to thank Michael Moore for his creation of the script, um, especially since we believe the script's wordplay really helped us achieve this main goal, and also to thank Wes for his uh, exceptional delivery of the voiceover. Um, and I'll give you a few examples. A place where you can get your hands on history. Come explore the boyhood home and fascinating career of North Carolina's Civil War governor. See what life was like in the Blue Ridge Mountains in the early 18th century. We invite you to experience all new exhibits in the Visitor Center Museum. All these statements, or invitations if you will, are very hard to resist when coupled with the beautiful picturesque scenery featured in our ad. In our filming, you may have noticed that the insides of the buildings were not shown. We were actually told not to film inside, <laughs> on the insides of any of the buildings or the home, 
um, and this was due to security reasons and not wanting to showcase the artifacts in case people would want to go, go by and steal them because it's not really a secure location. Um, and, but this actually really ended up being a benefit to us because it conveys the curiosity. You have to come explore for yourself to really see what life was like, see what artifacts you can look at. You also may have noticed that no people can be seen in this ad. Though this wasn't necessarily by design, we, uh, we ended up filming on a day when I guess there wasn't high traffic or high tourism. Um, but we also believe that it, this also worked out very well when you consider that the viewers are able to focus on the details of the scenery and minimizing the distractions. Finally, there is one important detail about Zeb that was left out of the voiceover, the fact that he was a slave owner. As evident by the semi-frequent basis to which the Vance Monument, Monument downtown is spray painted or defaced in some way, it's clear that many people are turned off about learning the history of Governor Vance due to this controversial fact. And because of that, it was important to leave that detail out of our ad so that the viewers would be more inclined to visit the site from a strictly historical and objective basis, just to simply learn what it was like to live in these mountains in the 18th century. And now we'll play the commercial one more time and then we'll take questions from the judges. Nestled in Weaverville's beautiful Reams Creek Valley, the Zebulon B. Vance Birthplace State Historic Site is a place where you can get your hands on history. Come explore the boyhood home and fascinating career of North Carolina's Civil War governor. See what life was really like in the early 19th century of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And in May 2016, we invite you to experience all new exhibits in the Visitor Center Museum. And now we'll take questions. So, who's your target audience again? Uh, generally older, uh, um, ages 50 and up. Uh, um, age demographic and then also considering uh, parents with children, slightly older children, middle school to high school because of the picnic area. It's a kind of a gathering spot that families can also get together as well. It's nice I've been out there but I, and I haven't been inside because it was locked up when I was there. But yeah. So it's interesting that point sometimes you could use that to your advantage in a concept like once for an archery, a bow, we said we would show you what it's capable of but that would only piss off the animal rights activists. You know, it's like it's, it's a way you know, right. to use that in your advantage that you can't show. But uh, I thought it was a, if I'm interested in the history of the Civil War and this era, the, you know, the 1800s, then this in, reminds me it's there or tells me it's there and, I'm, and I'm, I'm motivated to go. It doesn't get me interested in that era or in that history necessarily. I thought it was nicely narrated, and um, some of the shots were predictable, you know, a little bit straightforward, but again, it sounds like you were very much limited with what you could do there. Mm -hmm. But again, I think it's effective. I think it's effective if I'm interested in history, and particularly that history, um, but it, it doesn't do a, a great job of getting me interested in the history, but well executed. And I, you guys mentioned some things that you had that were really production challenges and even challenges with coming up with the um, concept and that you couldn't show it was in the buildings and that there was construction going on, so there was machinery and equipment and surrounding houses. Um, so I realize you guys have, and, and you mentioned also like leaving out the controversy um, about Governor Vance, but as somebody who doesn't know about that, that much history in that area, I, I feel the need for more information. Like I want to know what happens, what happened there? What was the, what story played out in this setting? Because really just for, you know, viewing it for the first time, I, it, it appears a little bit like a ghost town to me, like nothing happened there. And we've seen a couple of techniques today that, that are a way to show um, a bit of a time passage like animation or costuming that could be used um, in 
a scenario like this to show, um, you know, a reenactment of sorts, so that you offer the viewer a little bit of a, a hint of, of the history or story behind this place. Because really, again, the, the, um, the wood and the, you know, the bricks and mortar of the scene isn't what's as relevant as the story that's behind it. And that's the part that I'm missing. Yeah, I agree with both of your comments. Um, I thought, you know, it was nicely shot and, uh, y you know, it tells the story, but it didn't convince me. And I think even a little bit more convincing voiceover with a little more punch would have convinced me a little more. Like, to really try to sell me and hook me in, but I think this, it needed to weave in into all of the reasons you should go there even a little bit more to hook me. I can really imagine it being done visually with what you have almost as the, the backdrop of the commercial and having some very simple animation over it and sh that shows or gives us a hint of the, the story that's behind the place. Could be very nice, yeah. You know? Some good work and exploration and you know, some communication opportunity uh, still within it, you know, mm -hmm. I think, to better connect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So at this stage, I would ask everyone except the judges and myself to leave the room and take some food with you, please. And we'll be about 10 minutes deciding on what's going to happen. After quite a bit of deliberation, we've come to a conclusion. And I'm sure you want to know who won. But first of all, I want to thank our judges who really did a sterling job. And as I was saying to them, this was one judging competition where I feel that I need to show everything the judges say to the next class. I know you guys didn't like that part of class when we showed what the judges <laughs> said. But nonetheless, I will tell you this, you learned a lot from it because I can see the standard of the advertisements getting better every year, okay? And we started a new tradition. We're actually gonna give something to the judges. So we have these, these, very, these very fancy blue and black um, UNCA mugs. So. Whoa, did you hear what he said? Everyone gets a trophy. No, they don't. You, you've had me for four years. Everyone does not get a trophy. <laughs> the judges get a trophy. OK, uh, let me say a few things about what we saw today. The judges would like me to just tell you how many times ads are rejected, that this is a very tough business. And as one of the judges said, you need a thick skin, and you need to love this business if you want to stay in it. There is a lot of creativity, but you do need to have a bit of a tough skin. In second place. Oops. We have the Smith McDowell House. Smith McDowell House, second place. And in first place, and I'd like you to come up and get a picture of me <laughs> with this while I'm still here, um, is the Western Regional Archives. Gala, I know you were the creative person behind it. Congratulations, Tammy. Can I also just thank Tammy for putting together this whole thing with getting the museums to agree? It was, it was her expertise and knowledge that led all these museums to agree. Alex? I was in the industry for 15 years. <laughs> Congratulations to everyone. The judges were pretty unanimous in saying that this was quite a high standard. Okay, I think we can all learn a little bit from everything we did, but the work was put in. I was. The, the witness to six weeks of very hard work. And I do expect all the grades for the ad part of the, uh, the course to be quite high. It's your journals I'm worried about, OK? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Go home. <laughs>